Something maybe not quite right there with that uh, bumper video we had for you. We'll, ha we'll, we'll use it next week. You'll, you'll hear the sound. <laughs> oh, Sam, you can't sing that song just before I get up here on Sundays. <laughs> so, 
Well, this morning, we're in week two of a new sermon series entitled The End Times According to Jesus. And our primary text for the series will be known as what's known as the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapters 23 through 25. One day when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, some of his disciples said to him, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answers these questions in this discourse. And, he, and we get his take on the end times. Now, you helped to prove my point last week. If we had just called this a sermon series on the Olivet Discourse, you probably wouldn't have been all that excited. But because we're calling this series The End Times According to Jesus, well, I'm not sure I've had as an attentive crowd as I had last Sunday. And some of you said it felt like I preached only for a few minutes, even though I went almost 40 minutes. I've never preached that long at Woodcrest, so thanks for the permission to preach as long as I need to. Uh, for this series. Now, I mentioned last Sunday that we'll eventually get to those chapters in Matthew, but I pointed out the need to first explore some key foundational stones that relate to biblical prophecy, subjects that will help us understand Jesus' take on the end times. Now, one of the tensions I'm going to have each week is how much review do we need to do? Frankly, I've got so much material to cover each Sunday that if I spend too much time reviewing, we'll never get through all that I have. So my first challenge to you is this. If you're gone for a Sunday, go to our website, woodcrestchurch.org, go to the sermon links, and watch what you've missed. I I always find it a little weird to tell people to go watch me online. I I usually think you've got a whole lot better things to do with your life. But if you've missed a week, especially in this series, Go to the website and watch what you missed because I'm not going to be able to repeat everything, of course, that we've covered. And and we're going to build some foundation along the the way here. Um, That being said, I'm going to do a quick recap probably each Sunday just to remind us where we've been and set us up for for where we're headed. That's just kind of the nature by which I do things. And the first thing that I want to review with this morning is why we study biblical prophecy. If you're here last week, you remember the number one reason that we study biblical prophecy is because so much of the Bible is about prophecy, and that means it's really important to God. And as a result, it should be important to us. It's a part of the whole counsel of God. It should be important to us. We also study biblical prophecy because God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Let's face it, our our world is becoming more and more a scary place to live. And that's why we need to see what's going on in the world through the lens that God has given us so that we don't have to live in fear of the unknown. And finally, we study prophecy so that we can get a glimpse into the future to help us know how to live in the present. Friends, prophecy is not simply meant to be an academic exercise. The study of the end times is meant to be applicable for everyday living. I also shared a few ground rules and expectation boundaries, one of them being that we can't possibly cover everything the Bible teaches about the end times on a Sunday morning sermon series. So we're going to provide some extra resources along the way. Out at the Gather Center, there's a spot with a big sign with a series graphic on it, the end times according to Jesus, with the word resources. So stop by there on Sundays to see what's available. There'll be a weekly note-taking sheet for you to use, and there's actually a couple of resources that I'll refer to this morning that you can use as you're taking notes and keeping track of things. I also made a request that I not be bombarded after service with questions. I I really want to and I need to connect with people, especially if people are visiting on a Sunday. So thank you for honoring that. But please, if you have questions, email me at my my email address up there, pete.parker at woodcrestchurch.org. And many of you did that this past week. Way to go. Way to go. I I love your questions. And I'm going to do my best to answer them in a timely fashion, either responding to your email or in in a future sermon series, a future sermon to come. And I also want to clarify, I also clarified that last week, that I don't consider myself to be an expert on end time prophecy. I'm just an old-fashioned Bible preacher who tries to take a text or texts and tries to explain them, tries to understand them. What did it mean then? What does it mean for our, our lives now. 
Some of you are bigger prophecy buffs than I am. And we won't always agree on every subject and every interpretation of Scripture when it comes to end time issues. And from your questions and some of your comments that you've shared with me, we don't all agree about the rapture. And I wasn't shocked about that in your questions and your comments. And that's okay. In fact, we'll have to just agree to disagree on some of the minor issues of the end times. And while I think the rapture is important, hear me on this. It's not the most important issue. It isn't. Now, you're going to think after today, if it's not the most important issue, why are you spending so much time on it? And, and I'll explain that to you. But it's not the most important issue. The most important thing is that God's got a future mapped out for this world. And we need to make, re- make sure that we're ready for however that unfolds. That's what's most important. And so I hope we can agree on that. Because that's majoring on the major. That we be ready for the unfolding of God's plan. Now, because the study of biblical prophecy can be challenging, we're going to take our time through this journey so that we don't get lost. All right? So before we ever even get to the Olivet Discourse, we're laying down this foundation on some key end time subjects. And so before I kind of get back into it this morning, I, I, I really feel the need just to pray for us. Can, can I do that as we open God's word and begin to study it. Father, thank you for these moments together in your word. And Lord, I've probably not felt quite as humbled as I have in the last few months in preparing for this series. Um, Lord, I need to lean into you. I need to trust what you're teaching me, what you're showing me. But I pray and I'm thankful that every believer has the spirit alive in them as well, encouraging them, shining light on truth in their lives as well. And so, Lord, we we just lean into you for this teaching time and ask that ultimately your name be glorified as we begin to understand and see what Jesus has to say about the end times, that most importantly, we would be ready for it in our own personal lives and in the lives of those we love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the foundational eschatological event or subject that we started off with in our journey of understanding what Jesus has to say about the end times is the doctrine of the rapture. And I'm convinced that a knowledge, uh, an understanding of this, of this major event in eschatology, when it, what it is and when it will happen in the sequence of end time events is vital to our understanding of the end times. And we started with a simple definition of what the rapture is. It's an event that could happen at any time, at any moment. In a split second, every person who's ever trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, both the living and the dead, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and be taken to heaven to be with Him. The rapture is also a completely different and distinct event from the second coming. That's my take on it anyways. I learned this week, not all of you agree with that, and that's okay. That's okay. I think Jesus is physically coming back to earth after a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation, a time when God will pour out his wrath on a wicked world. And when he comes back, it will be to establish his kingdom. That event is what's known as the second coming. So for me, I, don't, I think there's a distinct difference. So we don't want to confuse the rapture with the second coming. Now, last week we also did a little language and history les- lesson around the word rapture. The doctrine of the rapture is taught in several places in the Bible, I'm convinced. Most notably, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in verse 17, it says this. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. That phrase, caught up, is translated, if you remember, from the Greek word harpazo, and it means to take suddenly or to snatch. And if you were here You remember the word picture I painted for you. Harpazo is what happens when your four-year-old child or grandchild is walking along with you and they're about to step in the mud puddle that you told them not to step into. And just before they step into it, you snatch them up. You, You suddenly remove them from the opportunity to get their feet muddy. And after laying out the language and history lesson, and then the Bible I talked about last week, the Bible was translated in the 4th century from Greek into Latin. And when they came to this verse, 
they translated the Greek word harpazo into Latin with the word raptius. Because the Latin word raptius means to take suddenly or to snatch. So after laying out the language and history lesson behind the rapture, we did a deep dive into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, where I'm convinced Paul lays out the doctrine of the rapture. And then I showed you a timeline to give you a picture of it. And I want to just quickly take us through the timeline again. And by the way, there are copies of this at the Gather Center. I saw some of you get out your phones last week and try to take a picture of the screen. So I thought, well, if I'm a good pastor, I'll just put this out at the, we- out at the resource table for you. This is how I t- tried to picture it for us last week. The cross on the far left represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And according to the Apostle Paul, when we believe in that, when we've put our personal faith and trust in that reality, then we do not grieve like those who have no hope, those that don't have a hope for the future. And then there's the timeline that runs from left to right, and simply over here references for me the second coming described in many places, but one would be Revelation chapter 19. And then we've got our first stick figure. That represents a believer who has already died. And according to the doctrine of the rapture, at death, that what happens is there's a separation of the material, the body, and the immaterial, the soul and the spirit. The body goes to the grave, the spirit goes to heaven. That's what death means. It's a separation of body and spirit. And by the way, Anybody want to guess what the number one question was this week that I got asked? It has to do with this thing right here. Everybody want to know about cremation? What about cremation, Pastor Pete? Well, here's a sidebar. This is free. You, you get this <laughs> as part of, a part of my thought. I personally believe the scriptures are silent on the subject of cremation. I believe it falls into one of those categories of our liberty in Christ to make wise choices uh, that we, we deem as we do life and, 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 and understand what we think is the best way to do something. And here's my opinion. It, it doesn't take very many years in which those bodies in the grave become dust and ashes anyways. And as my sister, who passed away many years ago, strong believer, she used to always tease. She was going to be cremated. She said, I just want to make it a little bit more challenging for the Lord when he comes <laughs> to, to resurrect me. So... Again, not to make light of a, of a subject, but that's my take on it. It's one of those liberties in Christ that we have. Uh, I think the scriptures are silent on it. And I don't think it messes with the rapture. All right? The second stick figure represents those who are alive in Christ when he comes back at the rapture. And that's what that first, less, first Thessalonians 4.17 refers to, that being caught up, that being snatched. We are snatched up from this world to be, re- to be caught up with uh, the unbelievers, or f- for the believers who are being resurrected and we meet the Lord in the air. So there's, there's that graphic that I referred to last week, and as I mentioned, there's copies of it out at the, uh, the Gather Center if, you, if you'd like to have that. And there's also another graph on the back of that if you've already picked it up, and I'll explain that a little bit later this morning. Now, you know what I mean by the tension that I'm going to feel every Sunday to do some review. We're already, what, I don't know, eight, ten minutes into this message, and I haven't even covered any new material. And this is where I have to admit that I've already told a mini-fib, just a mini-fib. I said last week that we were going to talk about the second coming today. And we will, maybe, maybe. But I still want to talk a little bit more about the rapture, and here's why. From the very first days of my preliminary study on this whole subject of end-time prophecy, I felt this strong, very strong impression from the Lord that I wanted to focus on what Jesus says about the end times. That's why I chose the Olivet Discourse over, say, the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel. Now, last week, we really explored what the Apostle Paul teaches about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. And certainly, don't get me wrong, that is still part of God's counsel to us. I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about Paul's teaching on the rapture. I think it's part of the counsel of God, and, and we need to understand that. But from the start, I wanted to see what Jesus had to say. So I've been wrestling with 
whether or not Jesus speaks about the rapture. Does, does he focus on that? Does he teach on the rapture at all? And that's what I want to focus on in the majority of our time today. Now, if we get through that, we'll transition to the second coming and start to lay out that second foundation stone. I'm prepared to cover it all, but it'll be a minor miracle if we do. So worst case scenario, I have much of my next sermon all ready to go if we don't get to some of it today. So, big question of the day. Did Jesus speak about the rapture? I think you know how I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> yes, I think he did. Or at least <clears throat> he strongly, strongly alluded to it. Now, one passage, I believe, he did this was when he raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. <clears throat> but because of time constraints, we're not going to explore that passage. Instead, we're going to explore a passage where I believe Jesus <clears throat> is certainly speaking about the rapture. So I hope you have a Bible with you this morning or a Bible app. Let's go to John chapter 14, and we're going to look at the first three verses. <clears throat> A scripture passage that I think is pretty familiar to most of us. Here's what John records, the very words of Jesus. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now, my hunch is the vast majority of you have no idea these verses are actually about the rapture. And for many years, I didn't understand it in that light either. I used this text at my mom's funeral, and trust me, back when I was in my mid-20s, I was not thinking at all about the rapture when I used these verses at my mom's funeral. But if you begin to look at these verses in light of how Jesus and his disciples understood it as Jews, I think you'll begin to see that it is, is indeed about the rapture. You see, as Gentiles, we miss the imagery in Jesus' words here because the imagery he uses is that of an ancient Jewish wedding. Yeah. Which, of course, we know nothing about. Right? Who here knows much about ancient, ancient Jewish weddings? About what I thought. None of us really understand what that's all about. That's why we initially have no idea that what Jesus is really saying in this passage of Scripture. So let me explain another important aspect of the rapture and give you some insight into ancient Jewish weddings. So not only are you getting some stuff about end times, you're getting stuff about ancient Jewish weddings today. Aren't you glad you came this morning? And that's going to help us see how the two are tied together and help us better understand what Jesus is saying here. All right. The other key aspect of the rapture, one we really didn't cover last week, is that the rapture is when Jesus comes back for his bride, his church. On many occasions, the New Testament compares the relationship between believers and and Jesus to a marriage covenant. And in that comparison, Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Let me show you an example of this. One day Jesus was asked a question by his disciples about fasting. And listen to his reply in Matthew 9, 15. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. I believe Jesus is clearly identifying himself as the bridegroom in that verse, and will soon be taken away, which is a foreshadowing of Jesus' pending death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. And now let's look at Revelation chapter 21. In his vision of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, John, speaking of the church, says this, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, the Bible states that as believers, we're joined with Christ and that we have become one in spirit with him. 
just as a married couple is joined and have become one flint. The difference is a believer's covenant relationship with Jesus is a spiritual marriage, not a physical marriage. So Jesus is pictured as the bridegroom. And the church, which is you and me and all believers throughout history, those that make up the church, we're the bride. And the rapture is when Jesus comes for his bride. And to truly understand the rapture, you have to be familiar with the traditions of a Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus. So let me give you the basics of the traditions. You see, the Jews in Jesus' day didn't allow dating or courtship. Marriage to them was a practical legal matter established by covenant. And it began with what was called the ketubah, which was a marriage contract that was signed before the wedding. Think prenuptial agreement, betrothal, or an engagement, except it's more legal and not all that romantic. Not all that romantic. This got me to thinking about my engagement to Dawn. We just celebrated 35 years of marriage this past Monday, and I was thinking about the night that I proposed to her. It was a super, super romantic event. I'm still proud of myself for what I pulled off that night. I planned it all out with a special dinner, a limousine ride, and I had the church sanctuary where I was serving as a youth pastor all set up. Lights down low, worship music playing in the background, roses laid out on the bench, a special bench on the platform, and I had the ring taped under the bench. Doesn't it sound really romantic? Doesn't it? You asked on about it. Now imagine me getting down on one knee, and with the engagement ring in one hand, I pull out a document with my other hand and say, hey, would you mind signing this legal contract to be man and wife before I give you this ring? Now maybe just a bit of a mood breaker, don't you think? But in ancient Jewish culture, a culture that really didn't believe in courtship, it was completely different. You didn't approach the woman. You didn't go ask the father for her hand in marriage. No, no, no. The groom went with his parents to the parents of hopefully his bride-to-be, and they worked out an agreement called the ketubah. Now that ketubah, that contract, that covenant, laid out the terms of the proposed marriage, and it included what was known as the mohair, which was the bridal price, the marriage payment made by the bridegroom so he could marry the woman of his dreams. Now, if both parties agreed to the terms in the ketubah, and they agreed to the mohair, the bridal price, the bride and groom would drink a cup of wine together, and then the groom would pay the mohair, and then he would depart to his father's house. But before leaving, this is what the bridegroom would say to his bride-to-be. I go to prepare a place for you, but I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. That was the words of an ancient Jewish tradition. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. It's exactly what Jesus says in John 14. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. Now, at that point, the bride was said to be sanctified. In other words, she was set apart to be the man's bride. And for all intents and purposes, she was considered to be married, even though they weren't living together as husband and wife. Now, here's, here's where it really gets cool. After drinking the wine and making the speech, the bridegroom would return to his father's house, and he would begin building a home for his bride on the father's property. And when the house was completed... The groom would stock the rooms with provisions. Why? Because after the eventual wedding ceremony, he and his bride would return to that house and enter the bridal suite, and they wouldn't come out for seven days. So they needed supplies for the seven days they were in the bridal suite or the honeymoon suite. Now listen, this is the key aspect of an ancient wedding. Only the father of the groom decided when the home was finished and when the bridal chamber was sufficiently stocked with provisions. So no one but the father knew when the groom was going to go get his bride. The groom didn't even know. Only the father did. Does that sound familiar? 
speaking about the rapture in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. No one knows that day or time, not even the Son, only the Father knows. It's the same with the traditions of an ancient Jewish marriage. Only the Father knew when it was time for the bridegroom to go and get his bride. And then this is where it gets even more cool. And the bridegroom, or the bride, was obligated to be watching for his return and ready to leave with him whenever he came back. And there's something else worth noting about an ancient Jewish wedding. The bride was required to have an oil lamp ready in case her bridegroom came late at night so that she could be ready to go at a moment's notice. The bridegroom would often go at night to surprise the bride. Believe it or not, that was considered to be romantic by the Jews. They weren't very romantic till this point, but it was extra romantic to go at night. And when that happened, the bride was said to be stolen by the groom who had proven his love by paying such a high bridal price, the mohair. So the groom came as a thief in the night to steal her way. Sound familiar? 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. This verse isn't talking about the second coming. The second coming doesn't unfold as a thief in the night. Only the rapture happens that way, at least my take. Now, I'm going to have you make a big jump with me. I'm going to explain this in greater detail in a few weeks when we get to looking at the book of Daniel and the 70th week of, of prophecy. But for now, I believe we can tell from Daniel when the Great Tribulation begins, and thus we can predict pretty accurately when the second coming will occur. And again, I've got another timeline for us up on the screen. This is on the back side of that handout that I've got out at the Gather Center for you this morning. Again, take a, take a leap of faith with me. I'm going to get to the greater details of this when we get to the book of Daniel, but this is how I think you can interpret Daniel's 70th week. When the Antichrist is revealed, the temple is rebuilt, and the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, I think that is the indication that the Great Tribulation has begun. And again, if you interpret the book of Daniel the, the way I'm looking at it, three and a half years or 42 months, or 1,260 days later, the abomination of desolation is going to happen. And the abomination of desolation is this. The Antichrist is going to cease. He's going to, he will not allow there to be temple sacrifices anymore in the temple. But the worst thing is, he is then going to set himself up as a god to be worshipped. That's the abomination of desolation. And again, as I interpret the book of Daniel, this is... Man, this is a 30,000-foot view at this point. Three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days later, Jesus returns to earth in his second coming. That's how I'm interpreting that. And again, as I mentioned, we'll get to that. We'll explore it some more in coming weeks. So Jesus, I don't think, is returning as a thief in the night at the second coming. In fact, when he comes at the end of the Great Tribulation, he will be clearly visible. The whole world will see him on that white horse as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation chapter 19. All right, now back to the tradition. I can't wait for all your questions this week. Somebody suggested that maybe like every fourth Sunday I should just do a Q&A session for the sermons. I don't know about that. But we'll see. So, so send me your question. Now back to the traditions of an ancient Jewish wedding for a minute. When the bridegroom would come to steal his bride, he takes her back to his father's house where they spend seven days together in celebration. And during that week, the couple remained in the bridal chamber, kind of like a honeymoon suite. The bridegroom and the bride stayed in the honeymoon suite, which was stocked with all those nice things, and they didn't come out until after the seventh day at which time they were honored with a feast known as what? The Marriage Supper. Now hold that thought for a moment. I'm going to do this to you most every week. 
hold that thought for a moment, and we're going to come back to it. But I want to pause here for just a second. Now, beyond more information about the end times, what I really hope you begin to see is if Jesus, as Jesus followed the Jewish wedding tradition down to the smallest detail in establishing a marriage covenant with us. So put the, put the marriage idea aside for just a moment, the, the idea of a Jewish man and a woman, and think with me on how this pictures what Jesus is talking about as the marriage covenant that he establishes with you and me if we are followers of Jesus. In the same way, he institutes a ketubah with us, a contract, a covenant contract, and he seals the covenant with a cup of wine. Remember his words to his disciples at the Last Supper, 1 Corinthians 11.25? In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new what? The new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. This new covenant is a ketubah agreement Jesus makes with us. And he confirmed this covenant with his own blood, which is the purchase price. It is the mohair. Jesus, the bridegroom, paid the purchase price. 1 Corinthians 16 Beginning in verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. What was the price? The greatest price ever paid. The death of God's only son on a cross. He paid the penalty for our sin in order to purchase us. Oh, that's so cool to me. I hope it's cool to you. Scripture is so rich with meaning if we dig a little deeper. Because we've been purchased with the bridegroom's mohair, like the bride in an ancient Jewish wedding, we too are sanctified. We're set apart for our bridegroom, Jesus. And we're to be waiting and watching for our bridegroom to come and take us to his father's house that he's been preparing for us. And that's what I think John 14 is all about. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So as you can see, the rapture is when Jesus comes for his bride and takes us back to his father's house for seven years, not seven days. Then right before we return to the earth with him and his second coming, we're going to celebrate as the recipients of honor at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you know who the honored guest was at an ancient Jewish marriage supper? The bride. The bride. Look at Revelation 19, 7 through 9. This is why it's at the end of Revelation, because I think the tribulation is over. And notice what it says. This has to do with the thought I had you hold for a few moments ago. Let us rejoice and be exalt and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted, granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So yes, for me, I believe Jesus taught the doctrine of the rapture. It's when Jesus comes back for his bride to take us to the place that he's prepared for us, as he taught in John 14. Those who have died before he comes back will be resurrected to meet him in the air. Those who are alive at the time will be caught up snatched up, raptured to meet him in the clouds. And then they go back to the place that he's prepared for his bride, the church. In summary, <laughs> I think that's the rapture according to Jesus. So on the test to follow, if I ask you what the rapture is, the correct answer is it's when Jesus comes for his bride. 
Now, I'll accept and give you partial credit if you say that the rapture is when the dead in Christ are resurrected and those who are alive and believe Jesus are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But I'll only give you partial credit because that explains what happens at the rapture. It doesn't explain what the rapture is. If you want to get full credit on the test, you need to answer that the rapture is when Jesus Christ comes for his bride, the church. Now, most of you are thinking, now, wait a minute, there's going to be a test? No, I won't give you a test. But you know what? If we're going to have a Q&A session, maybe there should be a test to follow. I don't know. It seems like it would be only fair. Well, I was afraid this was going to happen. Uh, so much to talk about when it comes to the rapture that we're really not going to get to the second foundation stone in the second. We, we teased it out by looking at Daniel 70th week. Of it. So, so I'm going to save that, that for next time. So let me close by asking the question we're going to ask each week of the series. So what? So what? What will we do with these new insights into the teachings of Jesus regarding the end times? Remember, the Bible, Bible prophecy is meant to give us a glimpse into the future so that we will know how to live in the present. First and foremost, the so what is, we need to make sure we're ready for however God's end time plan unfolds. And the only way to make sure we're ready is to be in a right relationship with God. Remember, the ketubah has been established and the mohair has been sacrificially paid. All you need to do to be ready is to personally choose Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. Friends, that's the crucial step in being ready for the end times according to Jesus. No matter your take on the rapture, that's what matters most. Are you spiritually ready? Have you said yes to the ketubah? And are you thankful for the mohair that's been paid in full so you don't have to pay for your sins? That's the most important so what question every week of this series. And some of you are probably going to get tired of me asking it, but that's the question every week of the series. Are you ready for however God's end time plan unfolds? Now, another way that God has encouraged me to respond to the so what question, I, I just love God's timing. It has to do with the blessing of of the Lord's Supper, which we're going to partake of this morning. just so happens to be a communion Sunday. You know, some Sundays we place communion before the message in the service. I told Sam, no, let's put it at the end because it fits so well, I think, with what we've studied in God's Word this morning. Friends, the Lord's Supper beautifully portrays what Jesus has done for us. It reveals just how much He, as the bridegroom, loves his bride, the church, and that's you and me. He saw us as the love of his life, the bride of his dreams. So he established a ketubah with us, a covenant contract, and he sealed the covenant with a cup of wine. This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. And our bridegroom confirmed this covenant with his own blood. And then he paid the mohair. He paid the purchase price for our sin with his own life through death on a cross. What an amazing price the bridegroom was willing to pay for his bride. If that doesn't refocus your attention for communion this morning, I'm not sure what so in a few moments, I'm going to pray, and the and, uh, worship team is going to play some music. We're going to invite you to come and receive the elements. I hope you have a new found appreciation for your bridegroom and just how much he loves you. What a price that he paid for you. And as you partake of the bread and the juice, as you contemplate the Lord's Supper this morning, remember that you are the love of his life. You're the 
bride of his dreams. And as such, may our hearts be surrendered with gratitude to Jesus for this amazing, amazing sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you were willing to set up a covenant with us, a new ketubah that would outline what it meant to be in relationship with you. And then you paid that ultimate mohair. You died on a cross for my sin so that the ketubah could be fulfilled and I could know the promises and the blessings of life, both abundant and life eternal. So this morning, our hearts are filled with gratitude for our bridegroom, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sending the gift of your son, the gift of the bridegroom to the church for each of us individually. And so as we partake of the bread and the cup, may we do so with a renewed reminder, a new renewed sense of celebration, of gratitude this sacrifice really means for our lives. I pray all these things in the name of our bridegroom, Jesus. stand and worship with us as you're able. Let's sing, let every heart
eyes to see the hurting and the broken. Let our lives align with every word you say. Happy Sunday, everybody. It's good to see your faces. Thanks for coming to church. We'll see you next week.